Welcome, dear readers. You're listening to Time to Read, a Winnipeg Public Library podcast book club. We are recording today from various locations around Winnipeg, all within Treaty 1 territory, the traditional lands of the Anishinaabe, Cree, and Dakota, as well as the birthplace of the Métis Nation and the heart of the Métis homeland. Our drinking water comes from Shoal Lake 40 First Nation in Treaty 3 territory. In this episode, we will be discussing Educated by Tara Westover. I'm Dennis from the Idea Mill, though I'm currently found at the Henderson Library, and I must admit, I enjoy a good herbal tincture every now and then. <laughs> Across the screen for me is... Hi, I'm Trevor, the branch head at the Louis Riel Library, and I'm still working through this crate of gummy bears that I put aside for Y2K. <laughs> <laughs> across the screen for me is... Hi, my name's Kirsten, and I'm the branch head at the Harvey Smith Library, and I have nothing. I've got nothing. Oh, you got nothing. <laughs> Sorry. Blanks. <laughs> you, you should have planned something and buried it deep in the ground I, behind the barn. I guess so. Let me reach into my head for the hills bag and see what I can come up with. <laughs> And you, dear readers, we couldn't do this without you. If you want to educate us about the books we're reading, you can find our email address and all of our social media outlets by going to wpl-podcast.winnipeg.ca and scrolling to the bottom of the page. If you hang around till the end of the episode, you can enjoy our special segment, Nerd Words for Word Nerds. In a moment, Trevor will give us a summary of the book, which, of course, is a bio of the author. But first, Kirsten <laughs> will give us a bio of the author. <laughs> which is a summary of her life. <laughs> Tara Westover, born September 27, Fish, 1986. She was actually not registered for a birth certificate until she was nine, so the date is a bit of guesswork. Tara Westover grew up in the youngest of seven children in Clifton, Idaho, population 259, described as a bit of a Mormon pocket in the shadow of a mountain. She lived in a small yellow house set in a field and was raised by parents who were members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and they were survivalists. I actually looked up a picture of that home now, and it is no longer a small yellow house. It's quite a huge brown humongous building. Tara actually describes a lot of her childhood as quite idyllic, um, with the mountains and fields to play in, her father's junkyard as a wild playground, and uh, herb gathering walks with her mother, who was a midwife and herbalist. At the age of 12, she undertook what she describes as a systematic study of Morse code, uh, no doubt to help her family out at the end of days, along with her head for the hills bag, which everyone had packed for themselves. Her family's life was quite isolated. They homeschooled very also... Uh, for the listeners at home, Kirsten is making the air quotes. The air quotes. Sign, <laughs> she says, oh, just because I know it's, this is, of course, a... <laughs> A audio medium. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they homeschooled their children. And Tara was 13 before she actually went over to another girl's house um, and met somebody who had actually gone to school. Although Tara never did invite that girl back to her own home because that girl had teased her for not knowing what a fraction was. So that's interesting because it was actually math that Tara ended up teaching herself in order to get into Brigham Young University and thus began her formal education. She then went on to uh, get a PhD in intellectual history and political thought from Trinity College in Cambridge. After getting her PhD, Tara decided to write her memoir. And in order to sort of get more of a sense of how to write, she knew how to do academic writing, but how to actually write as a creative writer. She listened to the New Yorker fiction podcast. She also said that she read David Sedaris and Mary Carr to develop a feel for nonfiction. I thought that was quite, quite interesting. I wouldn't have thought she was a, a would have been a fan of uh, David Sedaris. And as well, she read a lot of short stories. She says that she became sort of obsessed with short stories. And she also says that each chapter of the memoir is actually structured like a short story. 
She loves music, and you can find many clips of Tara singing hymns, uh, some at convocations, some in a television studio during an interview. You can just go and find them. She no longer identifies as Mormon. She tried to be a Mormon feminist, but was unable to reconcile herself to the church's teachings on women. And she currently lives in New York. And yeah, I would invite her over for dinner. Sure, she would have many interesting stories to, to tell, I would imagine. Even more than that than was in her, her memoir. She's had quite a life. Uh, while you were reading her author biography, Kirsten, I was going through my book summary and almost making a little mental check marks. Yep, 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 oh, yep. Sorry. <laughs> uh, no, no, of course. But I think maybe in the spirit of a memoir, which is based on one's impressions and memories, and they may not be entirely accurate and factual, I will provide, let's say, another version of Tara's life. This one from her book, Educated. So if you'll allow me to just maybe cover some ground that you've already covered, but perhaps cover a couple other things that uh, are beyond what you said, then mm -hmm. I'll proceed. <laughs> proceed. Educated is Tara Westover's recollection of growing up in an alternative household in southern Idaho. The youngest of seven kids, Tara knew her family was different from others in the community. Her father did not believe in public education, conventional medicine, and held a deep mistrust of the government. His paranoia manifested itself in a number of ways, including stockpiling food, supplies, and weapons for the end times. Instead of public school, Tara worked alongside her mother, assisting her with her midwife and herbal duties, and later worked for her father in the family scrapyard. Her father's erratic behavior likely a result of an undiagnosed mental illness, led to many poor decisions what left family members maimed or injured. Tara's relationships with her siblings heavily influenced her worldview. Whether it was the quiet encouragement of her brother Tyler, who urged her to get out as soon as she could to attend university, or her brother Sean, who inflicted years of physical and mental abuse on her, it all amounted to some kind of education. Tara's world changed when she was accepted into Brigham Young University at the tender age of 16. Her world expanded and she began to question and challenge many ideas she took as fact growing up. She met many mentors along the way that encouraged her and helped her complete her degree and continue on with a PhD from Cambridge. During this time, she drifted further away from her family and at the time of writing has not reconciled with her parents. Educated mulls the importance of family connections versus independence knowledge through education versus religion, and the role of memory in shaping who we are and who we may become. I love how you guys managed to make those sound different, even though they are basically the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> Let's start with our general impressions. What did you guys think? Yeah, I'm, I'm not a memoir guy, just generally, uh, unless it's like somebody that I'm actually interested in reading more about their lives. Like I'm not, I know there's some people out there that like gravitate to this style of book, no matter maybe what the subject matter is, it could just be almost like, you know, an interest in overcoming hardship. People are into that. You know, people seek that out. This book was a New York Times bestseller and on many people's must read lists. And part of the reason I think is that people generally like to read about hard times and overcoming them. This is the type of book that I probably wouldn't have picked up. Indeed, it's three years old and I hadn't read it before we picked it as a as a book but uh, yeah it's a it's a very uh i guess a uh, sad story of of a person's upbringing lots of missed opportunities and although i guess in the end she she's made a life for herself i i don't know i'm kind of rambling what do you, <laughs> what do you guys think we posted this question on, on Instagram and I don't think we've had such a response actually to a, to uh, one of our social media questions. And people really were responding very, very favorably. And, and somebody said, Ellie or LV Wegg said, I liked it so much more than I thought I would, as I am not usually a fan of nonfiction, but I couldn't put it down. George Etten uh, said, I continue to marvel that her life has occurred in the time period as my own. And that I thought that was actually quite interesting, too, because it's like, yeah, this was, you know, 2000, or the, you know, or in the 1990s, like this, this, you know, all this that was that was happening. Um, so yeah, 
lots of responses. People, uh, obviously, it's a bestseller. And uh, that really came through in our, from our readers, they they really, really enjoyed this book. Uh, it was interesting to me to hear her talk about the short story, and how much she likes the short story, because I did get into some chapters more than others. And when she said each chapter was sort of supposed to be read as a as a short story, uh, I could I could sort of see that as well. I mean, it was definitely a book that I I wasn't like aching for it to to end because I just needed to finish it. But uh, I was definitely engaged in it and horrified by it and enraged by it. And uh, yeah, I found it really fascinating. I found this book completely remarkable. Like I was ready to enjoy reading it just based on the bit that I knew about it, like growing up in a Mormon fundamentalist family, survivalists, never being in school until she went to university herself. I thought, okay, this is the type of story that I can be interested in. The details of the story and the way that she conveyed them really drew me in. And I found it captivating. I was blown away by what she endured and uh, the fact that she was able to do so much. Uh, like, that was one of the questions I had going into it. Like, how do you go from never going to school to going to university? That's a big transition. And uh, it was an even bigger transition than I thought based on the details of her life. And I was captivated by it. Like, it was a fantastic book. I, I look forward to reading something else that she writes someday, whatever it happens to be. <laughs> yeah, she's a good storyteller. And what did you think about, like, she would have little footnotes at the bottom that sort of were almost kind of saying, you know, this is just paraphrasing the email conversation or the telephone conversation, or this is this is based on my recollections, but my brother Tyler said, X or Y. Um, what did you think about that? Or did, well, the, did, did it even bother you? Or did you know the sections it? where she had the footnote talking about reinforcing that these were paraphrases, not actual words to me felt like those were the, uh, the guidance of a lawyer ah. uh, that, uh, hmm. that maybe said, you can't actually quote this with, without this person's permission or something to me that felt kind of like it was like a protection thing, uh, not really a style thing. But the other footnotes where she would tell a story like of one of the accidents and then say, this is at least how I remember it, but this brother remembered it this way or this brother totally remembered this other thing. I actually uh, almost appreciated her honesty in those moments by saying that her memory may be faulty, but this is how, this is her experience. And yet when she talked about it with her siblings, they remembered something else. And maybe from her academic um, background of mm -hmm. writing doing it as a footnote seemed to be more natural for her it it did seem a little, footnotes always seem to take you out of the flow of things uh, especially if you ever take the time to read them and these ones i would because it wasn't long you know a yeah. lot of times if there's a footnote you're like ah who needs who has the time to read that um <laughs> and maybe maybe it might have been a little more engaging if she work those other perspectives right into the narrative rather than have them as footnotes. I don't know, but I, I did appreciate I, it. It lent credence to the feeling that whether everything she was remembering was true or not, it's hard to say, but it lent credence to the idea that everything that she remembered was actually how she remembered it, that she was, she was working from her own memory or from her journals or, or, or things. Uh, and yet she was willing to admit them on some of the, details that she may not have had it right and isn't that interesting kind of thing so that, yeah. that's my take on them personally i really appreciated the footnotes um and when i started reading it i thought of them as a way of maintaining intellectual honesty while you're sharing your memoir like you've described but as it got towards the end of the book when she had talked to her mom or messaged her or whatever and her mom was like you know and telling her about sean and uh and she was like yes i believe you and now I've talked to your father and he's going to intervene, which was a very emotional thing. Like at that moment, I was tearing up because, oh, finally, there's a breakthrough. And then later on, when uh, she finds out, no, mom never talked to dad. Dad's furious about the whole thing. Everyone's been lying to her. And now they're telling her that she's lying. Going through that type of traumatic gaslighting so often as abused people often are, and as she was so many times throughout her life. 
the footnotes took on another tone for me where it's like she's still questioning her own memory. She still feels like she can't trust her own memory in parts because she has been intellectually, uh, emotionally beaten down so many times by her family that it took on that extra connotation for me there. Where she still, it, it still takes a lot of bravery when you've had your sanity questioned by the people you love so many times for her to still go out and say, this is how I remember it. This is my story. It became extra poignant at that point when I would see those little footnotes. She was trying hard to make it so that, you know, if someone challenged her, she could say, well, you know, I did say this is my memory, you know, but I, I believe that her memory is reasonably accurate <laughs> just based on the book. Yeah. And I mean, um, she was so young when a lot of these things happened as well. Like some of those mm -hmm. like terrible physical acts, the accident in the junkyard and the fires and, the, um, and, and so how she remembers it, it probably was just the way that she actually experienced it. Um, which then her older brother, Tyler, maybe just didn't experience it quite to that extent or in a maybe a, a different way. I, I just kept thinking about that little girl and oh my gosh, and, and all the, all the accidents and horrifying, the, the disfigurement and the blood and uh, like so many awful, awful things that, it, that happened and then never ever to go to a, to a hospital. You know, the whole time that, that principle of the family to never go to the doctor, never go to the hospital. Every time something worse happens, you're thinking, surely now, yeah, right? Yeah. Like that first car accident and the mother is clearly very injured. And the dad even says, what should I do to her as she's there injured in the car? And you think she has to say, take me to a hospital, right? No, take me home. When, when Jean, her father gets lit up I know. and and torched can barely breathe has no, no flesh lips. left on a lot of his body yeah. you think surely now <laughs> they must take him to the hospital no they ref they don't you know when you talk about people who really hold fast to their beliefs who go, go principle over everything else it's like that's it right there uh that blew me away and that they all actually survived. You know, I just <laughs> kept waiting mm -hmm. for somebody to actually die. I mean, because like they were hit in the head so many times with like huge iron posts or um, in the junkyard and like all the concussions and they must have. And yeah, the fires and the burning and they just kept applying those tinctures, which then Tara said, too. I mean, as far as I remember, they never actually helped anything. But, you know, no. Yeah. Yeah. But the legend grows because yeah. they all survived. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right. And, they, and then the father kept thinking, well, this must be God's will then. Yeah. If I, if he, you know, burned me with an inch of my life, I survived. And obviously that was a sign. I'll, I'll take the pain because it's, it's from God or whatever. And it's. Yeah. That, that line, this is the Lord's pain and I will feel every bit of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is like, oh. Mm hmm. Yeah. Yeah. When I was in, in high school, I, I was friends with quite a few Mormons and this is definitely not <laughs> Mormonism that you would just see, you know, no. every day. This is actually, and I think Tara Westover even says like, this is not a, a book about Mormons. This is a book about a family who has sort of taken this just to this sort of, well, it's about a whole bunch of things, but it's definitely not about Mormonism. So, um, I think that's really important to say. But, you know, the whole, like, when I read that uh, about her saying, you know, she tried to sort of when she was trying to explore, like when she was exploring feminism and trying to then sort of uh, reconcile that with herself, with Mormonism, and it just didn't seem to. Um, and certainly a lot of those conversations that kept coming up time and time again, you know, the power that her father had and her brother had, but even when she was at BYU, and like, every time she spoke to some male student, you know, and they would tell her, well, women don't have ambition, or mm -hmm. um, some of these things, it was just really quite enraging. And I, these are her experiences, of course. But uh, it would be interesting to hear a, a Mormon's perspective from some of those stories, like when she went to BYU and some of those kind of experiences that she had. 
Yeah, it's yeah. A definitely a, a different kind of narrative than uh, other memoirs that are, are written, say, about somebody that grows up in a polygamist kind of almost cult-like setting and then escapes that. The fact that her family was Mormon and, and grew up uh, with a sort of extreme radical version of it is almost incidental to the story. It's sort of, it's the flavor of the, of the abuse, but it's not the, the center of it. To me, it was the father's undiagnosed mental illness mm -hmm. and everything that sort of flowed from that was the mm -hmm. crux of the, of the problem. And that whether Jean was a Buddhist or, uh, or, or whatever, that part, uh, it would have been some contorted version of that, that, uh, he was passing down. So, yeah, I, I never got the sense that she was indicting uh, Mormonism it, it, as a whole. It was just her um, situation growing up. It was her all she knew, her culture, and just happened to be, yeah, uh, you know, in southern Idaho. And in what what did, what did you say, Kirsten? In a Mormon pocket. Pocket, yes. <laughs> a Mormon yeah. pocket, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it was definitely her particular family and the way that their dynamics mixed. Uh, I think one of the things that surprised me most about, about the story was how devoted she was to her family despite everything that they had put her through. I, I've said before on the podcast, I'm not one of those people who thinks you have to stick with your family no matter what. I think there are a lot of situations that justify cutting ties and... The events of her life growing up to me would fully qualify as some, as a reason not to ever see these people again. I realize it's complicated because her father's mental illness, it's not his fault that he was mentally ill. And there is a lot of sympathetic elements to her family too. But still, the, <laughs> the reckless negligence, which they was with their parenting style. And despite all of that, she tried her best, even as they were lying to her, even as they were threatening her, even as they were telling her they were cutting themselves off from her. Even at the end of the book, you get the idea that she still would welcome the opportunity to reconcile and to be together as a family again. And that amazed me. Yeah. Somebody somebody actually responded to one of our Instagram posts too. Stitcher Witch said uh, that she really liked how she wrote with so much empathy about her mm -hmm. family. And that... That really shone through where I, I know that she actually does talk about her, some parts of her childhood as being idyllic. That's why I added that in her biography. You know, she doesn't just, even though despite all of these just horrendous things that happened, she does recognize some of those pockets of happiness as well. And, um, sort of the idyllic world of living, you know, at the base of that mountain and also the ability of, for her to teach herself to then be able to get into get sort of formal education. She says comes from her family who or her parents who always thought you can teach yourself better than anyone else can teach you or certainly any of the other like public schools. So it's almost like. She almost sees her, that resilience and that ability to educate herself and then go into formal education as being, you know, because of what her parents instilled in her. And I thought that was, that's really generous. <laughs> yeah. um, well, and, and not just her, but two of her older brothers yeah. also uh, went on to university and also, I think, got PhDs. And yeah, that's right. So, yeah, yeah, I mean, at one point, I think, Towards the end, Jean says, well, I guess our homeschooling is pretty good after all if it produces three PhDs. And you're just like, oh, yeah, I guess if you look at it on the surface, that's a great outcome. But, man, what a process. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's got to be a better way. Yeah. <laughs> and the, uh, but, you know, it's interesting, too. I think that was another part of the story that maybe made it so popular was – the whole notion that, you know, in, in America, there's the idea of, uh, the self-made person and the, uh, you know, and so the, there's, there's an element of the story of Tara kind of overcoming all of these obstacles and, and, and pulling herself up by her own bootstraps and going ahead, which I could see is attractive to some people. But, but then she kind of cuts that argument off at the knees when she wins one of the awards. I can't remember if it's the scholarship to go to Cambridge or, or which, uh, and then she didn't want to do any of the press because she knew that the narrative that people would want to tell and she didn't want to be the poster person for the the self-made person so i was reading and thinking oh you know she's that person but then she kind of countered my argument before i could make it 
it because she <laughs> recognized she recognized that that was how people would perceive her story in some ways, and she she didn't uh, she didn't want to be that person, mm-hmm. even though she kind of mm-hmm. is. Uh, all this also ties into one of the questions we asked on social media. Uh, much of Tara's education occurred outside the classroom. And aside from your own school teachers, who have been important educators in your life? Well, we had someone on our Facebook page uh, respond to that question. Regan responded and said, my amazing grandma, my life partner, Cree and Anishinaabe elders, and the environment. Mm. Thank you, Regan, for that. Those are some powerful educators. (laughs) Yeah. Smallest Universe on Instagram said, Manitoba Winters. (laughs) 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 <laughs> <laughs> which I thought was a great answer because yeah, if you really embrace these manageable winters, they, that can teach you a few things <laughs> about yourself and uh, your own resiliency for sure. I mean, for me, it's probably a common answer, but uh, my parents were really important in my education. And the most important thing they taught me was the importance of communication in a relationship, mm-hmm. not deliberately, but by their example And it's something that stood me in good stead uh, in my own marriage and uh, other relationships I've had. But when I think back on this type of a question, I have learned so many things from so many people, which I think happened with Tara Westover too. Like she had a lot of different influences in her life that helped a little bit here, a little bit there at different times when it made a difference. I don't know. There's a lot of people sharing knowledge and kindness out there. Yeah, I was just uh, doing a... A training course actually this morning um, through the city and it was about uh, leadership and coaching and um, one of the hosts said oh uh, I think it's I it was Einstein that said um, education is what remains after schooling ends and I thought well, that that fits in with my afternoon conversation but yeah I because I really have been finding that I am learning so much from so many of my peers around me, especially in the last kind of year and a half of this very difficult time that we're in. And I mean, my colleagues, my friends, and I'm just learning so much about supporting each other and awareness of everyone else's complicated stories and how we can all sort of be there for each other. Initially, my my answer to this question had been my sisters, which I sort of think of in the same way. I, I've learned so much from my sisters throughout my life. And in a way, it's because I see them as sort of part of me. And yet they come with such a different perspective still and different knowledge. And yet we still sort of share the same history. But I, I just feel that they have been this like huge, uh, important source of education for me. I would say even more important than schools, but stay in school, kids. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I couldn't help but think about the most recent, this past year with the, the kids, you know, uh, doing remote learning and then yeah. back in the classroom and then out of the classroom and then in the classroom. And, and my, our own daughter, of course, is currently... Uh, remote learning and it's, it's <laughs> tough. It's yeah. tough. It's tough. And, and I think, well, you know, Tara Westover turned out okay. Uh, <laughs> so maybe there's, maybe there's hope. Maybe there's hope for the, this generation of kids. Maybe they're, they're more resilient than, than we think. And yeah, I don't know. Well, and there's still yeah. lots of learning happening, right? There's still yeah. lots of learning going on. And that's where we have to, not that we have to, but, I sort of feel like we need to really recognize just how much learning is happening beyond the classroom and how important that learning is. And yes, the classroom is important for lots of different reasons, but the classroom also isn't a fit for everybody either. So certainly the way it's structured for many, but that's a whole other conversation. It really is. <laughs> there, there are a lot of conversations you could draw out of this book. Yeah. Uh, it, it covers so much ground. I'll share one of the things that I think I found the most shocking Mm. in this book. It was when her brother, Sean, was violently assaulting her. Like, uh, I I think it was at the one in the parking lot (gasps) where they were at the store. And he was grabbing her by the hair, dragging her around, yelling in full sight of people. And Tara's response was to laugh as if they were playing a game to try to reduce her embarrassment about this situation. And I remember feeling so many complicated emotions, uh, reading that and realizing like, 
I remember when the Me Too movement was gaining steam and, and I was finding out so many people that I knew had had bad things happen to them that I never knew about. And part of the reason, of course, is that you don't talk about things like that generally. And I guess the extent to which a person will go to hide something that is happening to them that way and the way she would talk about it later where she like convinced herself it hadn't really happened. He hadn't really meant it. It had been a slip. She had done something to make it go wrong. All of those things that I have read about before as being factors in abuse and, uh, and you know, violent relationships. So in theory, I know this stuff, but when I, when I see the story, it still shocks me to my core that this is a, a human response to this type of thing. And I, I guess it reminds me too, when I encounter people and they're having a rough day, I don't know how rough a day they've been having. Cause, uh, if I had met Tara Westover later in the day that she had been assaulted, she would have not given me a sign about any of the stuff that had just happened to her. How many people do I meet where something really bad has just happened to them and I won't know about it? it makes me feel like I have to cut people a lot more slack mm. than I do sometimes. Mm. Yeah. Because you just don't know. I, I was really struck by that scene as well. And especially sort of the cackling laughter that she described that she sort of not cackling, but sort of almost maniacal. I could just, I could just hear it, you know, where she's sort of, you know, just trying to sort of, um, pretend that everything's okay. He's just making a joke. Um, and I remember it was right around that time too that she really starts to see herself as unbreakable. And she just tries to convince herself of that as well. Um, no matter mm -hmm. what he does, no matter <laughs> whether he breaks my wrist or, <laughs> um, I, I, I remain unbreakable and I'm not going to sort of, yeah, I, yeah, it was just, it was a very, very, those were difficult scenes to, 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 to read. Again, I think because Tara's quite a powerful writer as well, but, uh, yeah, very, very difficult scenes to read. I also really appreciated the insight she had where she said, you know, that, that feeling of being invincible, how none of this could hurt her. Yeah. She didn't realize at the time, but reflected afterwards that that was the harm it caused to her. It caused her to numb herself yeah. and to try to make herself immune to what was happening to her. And that was the damage mm -hmm. from those encounters. Mm -hmm. Another s scene that I found very, very difficult, and I was really uncomfortable reading it too, was the whole scene where Sean continually calls her the n-word um mm -hmm. that was that was horrifying actually <laughs> yeah that was pretty pretty difficult so it's this like this emotional abuse it's this physical abuse it's the gaslighting it's the just typical kind of abuser behavior you know coming later and apologizing and yeah and the way that tara would after she got out and if you want to use that term went to university her continual contact and return to Buck's Peak uh, when she didn't have to. But we're talking about earlier about the ties that she had and and how important family was to her that she she would continually put her back into these places where she was vulnerable and yeah, those were hard to read too. When when you feel like she's finally seeing the wider world and seeing things a little bit more uh, objectively, perhaps, or at least not so one sided. But then she still has, you know, her family. That's her. That's still her kind of north star. And it, I like that one part where she said, the first time she said she was from Idaho was the first time she realized she had left Idaho yeah. because you don't say mm -hmm. you're from somewhere if you've never left. And I, and I thought that was a very powerful idea that um, she can talk about her past now because in some ways it is her past because she's, she's, but it took her a long time to get to that point. Yeah. Just the loyalty <laughs> that she had to the family and to her father and to her brothers. Yeah. Despite everything was, yeah, that was difficult. And I know that she says that sort of the biggest question that still remains in her life that's still unanswered is that how her parents could have turned this blind eye to what what Sean did to her. And yeah. and I don't know if, if she'll get that answered at all. And but like you said before, uh, I think it was you, Dennis, that, you know, she would be open to sort of some sort of reconciliation, but she's not making that first step. She needs for them to come 
to her, I think. Yeah. Do, doing a little, you know, research after reading the book about the family. It's so interesting because she's writing about real people and real events. And with a little bit of detective work online, you can find the mom's herbal store. It's, it's online. You can make orders from it, essential oils and things. It apparently got into trouble last year because it was saying that some of their uh, ointments were, uh, would help with COVID. And, the, and so the Food and Drug Administration, uh, you know, had told them to put a, put a thing up on their website. And, uh, and apparently the mother, you guys may know this, has written a rebuttal, a book that she's called Educating, mm-hmm. uh, self-published. I was going to say that, mm-hmm. which sounds like she tells her version of things. But it's really just reinforcing the father's, I think, narrative or the, or the official Westover family narrative that everyone, well, not everyone, but most of the family has bought into. Either you buy into it to be part of the family or you're on the outs, like, uh, Tara. And then you have sort of the brothers, like Tyler, who is like, who knows how he, where he stands, right? He's, he sort of stands with Tara, but then he's also able to still visit the family. And I don't know what kind of, what kind of acrobats he does in his head to ra- to rationalize that, but he's yeah. so anyway. It's interesting to kind of read, and <laughs> I got out down this rabbit hole of Idaho state law, and <laughs> uh, apparently, I guess uh, the Westovers are involved in a lot of litigation, but mm-hmm. just like kind of petty stuff, like they're suing their neighbors because something you know is, is trespass, and and uh, and so it's yeah. There's just a lot of stuff going on there. That's. Uh, I'm sure there are a lot of stories that she could have drawn on even more than what we've had here, because it just seems a very rich yes. ground for that. <laughs> but uh, I, and I hope that she writes a follow up someday to just to find out what else happens, assuming anything else does the, in this journey of hers. Yeah, I read that she she's really passionate now about like rural education, and that's sort of something that she's been writing and researching and kind of. Yeah, less less the creative writing stuff that I could tell, but but that whole area, rural education, which I thought was interesting. Yeah, mm-hmm. she has a valuable perspective on that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, before we move on to our next segment, uh, do we have any final thoughts about the book? Well, you know, I opened by saying I'm not usually a memoir guy, and it's true, but I'm I'm definitely glad I read this. I, I feel like it was very well written. You're put right into to Tara's shoes, if you will, experiencing things, and it's a remarkable story. And you know, I wish her well. And uh, <laughs> yeah, she showed me a, a side of a life that I thankfully have not lived personally, and gave me a lot to think about. It's a marvelous book that I think is a, a good read for a lot of people. Uh, it's got a lot of very sensitive topics that are disturbing. Uh, so if you're not in a place for that, I totally get not wanting to read it. But uh, if you're emotionally stable enough to absorb that, I highly recommend it. Okay, so uh, from there, let's move on to our next segment. Can you tell me a book I would also like? Who has something to recommend? I can tell you a book you would also like. I'm wondering if I maybe already mentioned this book, but uh, it was maybe so long ago, but I don't think so. Uh, it is called Something Fierce, Memoir of a Revolutionary Daughter by Carmen Aguirre. I don't know if uh, I've mentioned it before, but it is a memoir written about the time period after the coup on September 11th, 1973. The coup that removed uh, Allende, Salvador Allende, from office in Chile. At that time, six-year-old Carmen Aguera, the, the author, and her younger sister flee the country with their activist parents for Canada. But then five years later, in 1978, the Chilean resistance calls back all their exiled activists. And so Carmen and her sister Ale uh, go back to South America so she's like, what, 11 now, uh, with their mother. And they set up a safe house for resistance members in Bolivia. And so the book covers the, this like 10 year period where they're involved in all these sort of like 
revolutionary kind of behind the scenes kind of work as children and uh, becoming teenagers. And uh, so it's, it's fascinating. But then also during this time too, Carmen just wants to be a teenager too, and worries about how she looks and whether she likes boys. But meanwhile, she also has to, she has like this double identity. It's just wild. But then at 18, she j- herself joins the resistance and moves to Argentina to live the life of a revolutionary. It's also like it's such a story, and it's so well written. It's very, it gets very personal. It's sometimes it's super brutal, um, but it's also quite funny. Which sometimes, terror Westover sometimes sometimes it was funny. Like all those the canning of all the peaches. I just every time she mentioned that, uh, I I found it kind of funny. But that's all that they were canning. Peaches, peaches, so many peaches. And Carmen Aguera actually um, lives in uh, Vancouver and is quite a famous playwright, actually. So she is the author of Something Fierce, Memoir of a Revolutionary Daughter. And her second book is called Mexican Hooker Number One and My Other Roles Since the Revolution. Uh, because she became <laughs> mm. like a, an actress and playwright and, of course, was always cast as the Mexican Hooker Number One. Mm. Anyway. I I really recommend something fierce. I had uh, I had a book lined up to recommend, and then th- this very morning, this book came across my desk, so to speak, that I thought it was even a better recommendation. So I have not read this book, but I think if you enjoyed uh, Educated, that this will be another book that you may like. It's called Unfollow by Megan Phelps Roper. Now, you may recognize that name oh, as uh, the granddaughter of uh, Fred Phelps, the founder of the Westboro Baptist Church, which I think is pretty much a cult. It's pretty much the family. They call themselves a church. You may remember them from around the time of 9-11. They would picket uh, soldiers' funerals. They would picket uh, people who died of AIDS. They would, they, they're they generally like horrible, horrible people. And Louis Theroux, a documentary filmmaker, has made a number of films about the family. The first one, I think, is called The Most Hated Family in America. And then he goes back and he revisits uh, them over the years. But this story, Megan Phelps Roper wrote, she was born into this family slash church. She grew up in it, believing everything. And she also then became the social media face of the Westboro Baptist Church and would engage in arguments with celebrities and people on Twitter supporting the church. And and then bit by bit, through one particular conversation that she talks about in the book, where she was actually then challenged a bit and opened up and somebody that wasn't judging her, wasn't meeting her hate and anger with hate and anger, but actually started to ask her questions that she actually began to think about. Little by little, it didn't happen all at once, started to question her beliefs. And uh, in 2012, I think she and her younger sister made a break from the church and slash family and uh, is living now away from it. And so it tells her story. It says, my memoir of loving and leaving the Westboro Baptist Church. And so there's a lot of parallels uh, to Tara's story uh, in a way. In fact, uh, here's a fun fact. Uh, Megan Phelps Roper and Tara Westover were both born in 1986. So, um, uh, anyway, I'll just uh, leave that for your, for your reading interest. It's called Unfollow from uh, Megan Phelps Roper. Fantastic suggestion. I'm looking forward to reading that now. <laughs> so one of the elements of this book that stuck with me was the abuse Tara suffered, both from her, the reckless neglect of her parents and the controlling violence of her brother, Sean. And it reminded me of another book I've read, A Child Called It. One Child's Courage to Survive by Dave Pelzer. So uh, Amazon's description of the book is, This book chronicles the unforgettable account of one of the most severe child abuse cases in California history. It's the story of Dave Pelzer, who was brutally beaten and starved by his emotionally unstable alcoholic mother, a mother who played tortuous, unpredictable games, games that left him nearly dead. He had to learn how to play his mother's games in order to survive because she no longer considered him a son, but a slave, and no longer a boy, but an it. His story is haunting and difficult, so pick a time when you're feeling emotionally resilient to read it. Um, It covers his early life up until he was finally rescued from his home around the age of 12. He wrote two follow-up books, uh, The Lost Boy, A Foster Child's Search for the Love of a Family, and A Man Named Dave, A Story of Triumph and Forgiveness. 
but I, I will emphasize, be in a stable emotional place when you read it because it is uh, hard to read. Yeah, I almost, I my- almost started weeping just hearing you <laughs> explain it. <sighs> oh, and just remembering the book uh, made me tear up a little yeah. bit just because uh, <laughs> you don't think people can do certain mm-hmm. things to other people, but it turns out they can, yeah. and it is uh, heartbreaking. Yeah. But let's move on now. To something more cheerful, Uh, our favorite segment, Nerd Words for Word Nerds, in which we deliver a short dissertation about the words or phrases that have been bouncing around in our brains over the past month. I'll go first, um, because my nerd word is memoir. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Memoir, an essay on a scientific or scholarly topic, or an account of uh, the author's personal experiences, um, an account of something deemed noteworthy. It's from the early 15th century, the Anglo-French memory, something written to be kept in mind. I was reading something as well that talked about memoirs as opposed to autobiography and memoirs being more of a collection of memories written by the person themselves and autobiography, which is the story of a person's life, which I think is there there is that distinction um the the memory part the collection of memories and i i know tara westover her recollections weren't always what her siblings recollections were uh and i certainly i can um identify with that because that happens in my family all the time so memoir has been on my mind not just because i've been reading this this book uh this week but my dad, he's 81, and he's been sort of um, collecting a little bit of a musical memoir. So he started thinking about how he, he, list, he has all this huge playlist and he was listening to all these songs. And each song had sort of a particular memory for him from, you know, where he was, who he was with, why he loved it. And so he decided to collect 81 songs and they range from old, old songs from when he was a young boy in Germany to he's got I think three Chumbawamba songs on there which I, I don't know <laughs> he's got eclectic, <laughs> he, went through, he went through a Chumbawamba phase <laughs> eclectic taste um, and then all the way to the present and each song has a memory or a purpose for why he chose it a story a person so I've just loved this idea of this musical memoir that my dad's been gathering and uh, yeah so that's also why I've been thinking about about memoir. So that is my nerd word for this month, memoir. Well, Dennis, you said it best earlier when you said that there were a lot of things in this book that we could branch off and talk about. And for me, uh, you know, I've gone to uh, Google Street View and I I found the house. I found I found everything. And I sort of became obsessed with those parts of the book where the father kept during his sort of manic phases, building and rebuilding and adding on and, and changing things. And so my word for this month is bungalow. <laughs> now, you would think it would be a very simple word. Here in Canada, I think we could all agree that a bungalow means a one-story house. But wait, it's not that simple. It could mean a story and a half in some parts of the world, in most parts of the world. It could mean any number of things. In fact, the most defining feature of a bungalow is not the fact that it's one story. It is whether it has a large front porch, which many bungalows here in Winnipeg do not have. And this information comes directly from the American Bungalow magazine website. <laughs> yes, there is a magazine <laughs> called American Bungalow. Um, Still you know, in print? What, uh, you know, <laughs> I, I, I think the most recent issue was published in 2020. So, uh, but I imagine if it's published at all, it's probably quarterly. I can't imagine a monthly publication all about bungalows, but you know, you don't know. I, I, you know, check the website. Maybe we'll put a link to the website up and we, and you can do your own research if you're thinking of getting a subscription. But the, the word bungalow actually comes from the Hindustani word bangala, which simply means belonging to Bengal, Bengal, sorry, because a part of India, the province in India, and it became into the English parlance during Britain's, uh, the rule when, 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 when Britain was ruling India and their officers and things were there and the houses there, they were referred to as bungalows because they were, uh, low, uh, kind of, uh, low pitched roofs, big 
porches because to let the breezes in and most generally were on one floor. And so then that word from Britain then got transferred over to America as things often do. And it became popular in the earlier part of the 20th century in the States and then in Canada. But in America, you can't just stop by calling things bungalow. They have several different subsets of bungalows, which I'm not going to go through them all. But for example, the classic is the craftsman's bungalow, craftsman bungalow, which you could buy toll kits for. Uh, at one point, Sears Roebuck would sell the plans and other stores would get on the bandwagon where they would actually send out the entire supply. It was like Ikea before Ikea existed. You could get like boards pre-cut, all the nails you'd need, and they'd just be dumped, you know, in a field. And so uh, you get a local uh, tradesman to, to build it, and, and there you go. Um, then you have the California bungalow, which, as far as I could tell, is the same as the Craftsman bungalow, except the building supplies, building materials are a little bit different. The California bungalow tends to use stucco and wood, not brick. Then this is my favorite, the chalet bungalow, which has a loft. And it made me think back to when my wife and I were uh, house shopping, and the very first house we looked at, it was on Strathcona in the uh, in the West End. It, it had this. I didn't know it was called a chalet bungalow at the time. And and to this day, that house is the high water mark of houses. We're like, oh, we should have gone for that one. We should have gone for that one because <laughs> because uh, there's no house, including the one we're living in now, that came close to that one. That one, you know, and of course through time, uh, time, you know, puts rose colored glasses on everything. I built this house on Strathcona up in, in the mythology around it being this is the perfect place to live. Oh, I, I, I can keep going. This is crazy. There's the, there's the Chicago style, also known as the Prairie style. Frank Lloyd Wright got involved in bungalows, if you can believe it. And there's something called the Milwaukee style. And I, I think the difference with that, the gables are on the side uh, as opposed to the front. Uh, there's even something called an airplane bungalow where it has one little room on the top with windows all around the sides. So, uh, I mean, I can't, I, you know, it's exhausting just even telling you all about the bungalows. <laughs> is there uh, an Idaho but, bungalow? Oh, there, there very well could be. Um, but I didn't come across that. But so just to, just to close up, I'll say that ironically, the bungalow that had once been the symbol of retreat to the countryside became the architecture of the city and its suburbs. Yet the bungalow did not lose its identification with the rural idol and better golden days. Be it ever so humble, it embodied an ideal for the majority of Americans. The freestanding single family dwelling set down in a garden, an ideal that persists even today. Oh, goodness. Goodness Mm -hmm. me. That's a lot in there, that description. (laughs) It can never never just be straightforward. (laughs) Nope. So today I've decided to share one of my very favorite words as my nerd word this month. And that word is suboptimal. I love everything about this word. (laughs) It starts with the sub prefix, which means under or less than completely or nearly and then continues with optimal, which means most desirable or satisfactory. Combined, you get a word that you can use for anything that's not absolutely perfect, which is pretty much everything. There's a lot of power in a word like that. That range of meaning gives you enough leverage to work your way out of tight situations. Someone whose feelings you don't want to hurt asks for your opinion on a performance of theirs that went horribly awry? Well, it was suboptimal. You know that in this case, suboptimal means terrible, but they can take it to mean a little rough. The range of the word means you can give them an honest answer while they can take it for whatever level of less than perfect that they can accept in that moment. And that's a win for everyone. (laughs) Another thing I love about this word is that you can use the range the other way to bring out some nice understated humor. Have you just regaled your coworkers about the time the air conditioner repair technician dropped his drill and broke the drain vial off your hot water heater, flooding your basement and causing you to miss your sister's birthday party because you had to spend hours trying to get the carpets dry? Describe the experience as suboptimal, and you'll get a pitying chuckle, which is almost enough to compensate for all the time you had to spend with that shop vac. (laughs) And another thing I love about this word, the thing you want is right there within the word itself. When I say something is suboptimal, I'm also implicitly suggesting that, with some work, that something could become optimal. There is an acknowledgement of the possibility of improvement, a target that can be hit, a goal that can be achieved. If I tell you it's bad, you just hear bad. But if I say it's suboptimal, you can also hear the possibility of it becoming good. You can put in the time and effort until the sub disappears and what is left is optimal. (laughs) 
suboptimal. <laughs> I think I, I've been operating as uh, pre-optimal these days. <laughs> <laughs> I know optimal is there, but yeah, just. If I ever read a biography, it'll be titled Suboptimal. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Unfortunately, that's all the time we have for this month. Thank you so much for joining us, dear readers. Spring is a time when love is in the air, or so I've heard. So in June, we're reading Laura Dean Keeps Breaking Up With Me, a graphic novel written by Mariko Tamaki and illustrated by Rosemary Valero O'Connell. According to the publisher's website, it's a sweet and spirited tale of young love that asks us to consider what happens when we ditch the toxic relationships we crave to embrace the healthy ones we need. Have an idea about what we should read next? Let us know. You can find all our contact info at the bottom of the page at wpl-podcast.winnipeg.ca. You can also find all our past episodes and discussion questions there too. If you haven't already, subscribe to Time to Read on your favorite podcasting service and maybe leave us a review. Tell your book-loving friends about us, too. And until next time, make sure you find... Time Time to read. Read! like the pros do <laughs> and we're discussing pros so you know Ooh, right on it all works I, out i see what you did there <laughs> <laughs> are we the Can pros pros we are the pros pros and we read pro pros and we are pro pros as opposed to anti pros we are pro pros yeah Pro pros, pros, pros. Pros before nose. <laughs> yes. We have a propensity towards pros. Oh my gosh. <laughs> 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 <laughs>